It's our third lecture. It's Friday. Hope you guys are doing well. A um, couple of quick announcements before I get started. One thing is that over this weekend, I would like all of you to go to our website and fill out your preferences for what time you can go to a section. And we're going to um, assign you to a section early next week. Now, normally on my website, there would already be a link to do that on the front page of the class website. But um, there was some kind of issue with it. So I, I'm going to post a link to it after class. Uh, the, the section signups are done through this other site called cs198.stanford.edu. They told me that the link was there, but I don't see it. I don't, maybe I don't see it because I'm the teacher. Maybe it doesn't show the link to me, but they told me if you go to cs198.stanford.edu that you'd see a link to sign up for your section. But again, like I couldn't find the link on my version of that. Page, so don't see it? Okay. That says apply to section lead. That's if you want to be a section leader. So anyway. But that, I thought that was just for. Okay. Oh, so in here, if you were a student, you could sign up. Okay, cool, cool. So I'll post a direct link to that after class. Uh, you can do that through the end of the weekend. It's not first come, first serve, so don't you don't have to race and do it right this second. Uh, they wait till Monday and then they grab all the names and they, they run an algorithm and they assign you. So you'll you'll do that over the weekend. I will send you an email to remind you about that. Um, our first homework assignment is up, and I'll talk about it later, but it uses the material through the end of today's lecture. Uh, <laughs> it's got three parts. You have to do a Mad Libs program, a Game of Life program, and a Photoshop program. And you know, remember how I said you'd be an idiot to stay in this class, right? Just for reference, this part is the 106B homework assignment. <laughs> so uh, you have to do that plus two whole other programs. Um, this again comes from my uh, not being a nice person, but uh, yeah. Anyway, so homework one is up and it'll use the material from this first week. It's due next Friday. So okay, having said all that, I think I want to launch into the class material now. So we had been talking about how to do strings, or excuse me, how to do functions in C++, and the next topic is strings. So you guys already know about strings from another language like Java or Python or JavaScript. So I don't want to spend all of my time relearning what a string is from the start. But let's talk about C++ issues with strings, right? So if you want to use strings, you have to include a library called strings. Uh, I'm using the square, the, the in brackets here instead of quotation marks. What does that tell you about the string library? It's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a open library. Yeah, it's a, it's a um, system library that is not a Stanford local project library. It's just a part of the C++ language. So if you want to use strings at all, you have to include this string file. Uh, so then once you've done that, you can create a string variable, s, uh, set to hello. Small piece of trivia. I don't want to answer 100 questions about namespaces again, but the, <laughs> the class string comes from the std namespace. So if you don't say using namespace std, you'd have to write std colon colon string. But whatever. That's how you create a string object. You guys know what strings are. They're sequences of characters. Uh, let's talk about the differences in C++. So just like in, in Java and most other languages, the strings have indexes where the characters are indexed 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Um, the strings are in quotation marks, just like in Java and most other languages. They use those escape sequences with the backslashes in front of them, like slash t for a tab or slash quote for a quotation mark. A lot of that stuff is the same, but there are some differences, like some of the names of the methods, the functions you would call on a string have different names or slightly different behavior, so I'll show you those. Also, there's a few sort of structural differences that are kind of interesting. The most surprising is that there are actually two different types of strings in C++. Um, I'll talk more about that in a minute, but this is like part of the joy that is learning the C++ language, basically. Uh, so again, the, the characters of a string have indexes that start with zero. Each individual character is stored inside there as a value of type care. You can access the individual characters using square brackets. Now that's actually something that some languages cannot do, like Java cannot do that. You have to call a method to get the characters out in Java. In C++ you can use these brackets just like you would with an array or something like that. So if I say S bracket 3, that means the character in index 3, which is the capital D. 
Uh, there's also a method called app, which is like the Java care app method. You can, it's exactly the same. You pass a, an int index and it'll return the characters stored there. Um, but most people just use the square brackets. Um, and uh, if you've ever learned about uh, integers and characters, most languages have some kind of mapping between the two, where the characters are actually stored in the computer with a numerical code, like an ASCII code or Unicode or something like this. So like the letter uh, H, uppercase, is actually equivalent to the integer 72, and you can type cast between those two things and back. We're not going to do a lot of that in this course, but that concept is... Uh, you know, common among a lot of programming languages, okay? So that's kind of basic stuff. Here's some stuff you can do in C++ with strings. You can concatenate them with a plus, like M-A-R plus a C-Y makes Marty. That's pretty normal from, uh, from Java, right? One thing you can do in C++ that you cannot do in a lot of languages is you can use operators like greater than or less than to compare ordering. It's done based on ASCII values, which basically means a case-sensitive alphabetical order comparison with, I think, uppercase being less than lowercase for some reason. But um, you can also use equal equals operator and not equals operator and ask whether two strings are the same. If you're a Java person, do you remember, well, you cannot do that really in Java, right? How do you compare a string and see if it's the same in Java? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, again, if you don't know Java, that's fine. But you write a method called dot equals, E-Q-U-A-L-S. And if you don't do that, it doesn't quite behave properly. C++, you don't need to do that. C++, the operators just work. Uh, side note, the reason that that's the case is because C++ has a feature that Java doesn't have, which is called operator overloading that I'm going to talk about later, which means that you can define operators to work on other types that they didn't used to work with. So uh, this works in C++ and does what you want it to do. Yeah. So what's the difference between using a plus operator if you want to concatenate strings and then before when, when, when you printed it out, like, Oh, right. Um, so his question was, uh, here I'm doing plus to glue strings together. But in the previous lectures, when I wanted to print like a line with some text and then a variable and stuff, I used the like less than, less than. Why didn't I just use a plus for that if plus is here? If, if we have plus, why don't I just use a plus for that? Um, the reason is because the plus only works on strings with other strings, not string plus an int, not string plus a double, not string plus anything. Um, and so you would have to call a conversion function on the end. And so the decision is just that the less than, less than is a better style for that. So yeah, that's a good question, though. Yeah. When I tried to concatenate, when I was doing one of the exercises, trying to concatenate two strings when not able to see out with the bracket bracket operator, it gave me an error. Is that a You got an error concatenating strings? Well, um, I will show you. I think that might have to do with what I'll show you on the next couple of slides, which is about these two different types of strings. Uh, I've carefully chosen these examples because there are slight deviations from these examples that suddenly don't work. And so I'm kind of lying to you for a minute, and then I'm going to show you how shitty it all is. <laughs> but I'm like, for now, I, I'm, I'm trying to build, you know, I want, I want an emotional turn, like, a, like a, a denouement in the middle of the lecture, you know. Look it up. Uh, I want you to think like, hey, I, you know, I bet some of you right now are like, cool, this seems pretty cool. Like, it's about the same as Java or whatever. And oh, I can do like less and greater and equals, it. well, this is better, this is great, this is so cool. <laughs> well, I'll show you, I'll show you. Uh, but I'll get there in a second. So one other thing that's kind of different about strings in C++ and in a lot of other languages like Java, Python, JavaScript, is that in, in C++ you can mutate, you can change a string. So here I have a string S1 that stores Marty. If I call append step, it changes S1 to store Marty step. Now you might say, well, isn't that like plus equals? I mean, of course you can change it to, from Marty to Marty step. But the difference is that in most languages, operations that change a string actually sort of return a new string. And if you want to take that new string and store it in place of the old one, you can. But this isn't returning. It's like going inside the existing string and messing with it. So like S1, I don't know if this is a subtle concept, but I'm modifying an existing object rather than creating a new one based on an old one. There's an important distinction between those two things. Um, so there's methods like erase. You can just delete characters out of a string and they're gone now. So that's fun. 
Anyway, okay, so here's some of the, the, the things you can do with strings, but uh, let me show you some more. So this slide just lists a bunch of the methods that strings have inside of them. Technically, C++, we don't use the word method. You're supposed to call it a member function. It's a function that's inside of an object. It's a member function, but sometimes I'll just say method for that. But um, most of these member functions are pretty much the same as some function you saw in your language before, like Java or whatever. Um, like, there's a compare function, which is a little bit like compare to in Java. There's find, which is like uh, index of in Java. There's length, which is the same as Java. There's replace, the same. There's substir, which is the same as substring in Java. So a lot of this, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, because mostly this is just mapping from names you've heard of to the names that C++ uses. A few of these functions have slightly, oh, wow. <laughs> wow, Patton Oswald is tweeting about his puberty. Well, that's great. <laughs> Can we maybe mute that? Huh? How about that? Uh, notifications. Blocked? Hmm. All right, whatever. Sorry. <laughs> I've, I've gotten all kinds of stuff. My favorite pop-up that I got during a lecture was I popped up one that said, uh, your torrent download, Game of Thrones, is complete. <laughs> 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 I've gotten a lot of stuff. I've gotten a message from my girlfriend, now wife, that I might not have wanted to pop up on the screen. I've gotten all kinds of things, but we're not gonna <laughs> that. That's all I'm gonna say. Uh, question, yeah. Is there a screen size? Uh, this one, no, they're the same. Uh, why do they have two names for it? It's because they wanna be compatible with certain other objects that have a size method or a length method. There's certain cases where they want the same method to be available in a lot of different classes. Uh, yeah. When you're talking about the difference between append and like plus equals, does that mean that append is more efficient or somehow like better? I wouldn't worry too much about efficiency of these methods. I mean, some of them have efficiency aspects. Like if you if you make a whole new string, it might have to copy it in the memory. Um, I would say those things matter a lot more when you're dealing with a very long string. If the string is short, it really doesn't matter much at all. Or if you're doing that operation a million times in a loop, it starts to matter. We're going to talk a whole bunch about algorithm efficiency later. And so there are cases where we will care about that. Like one example would be if I'm going to build up a whole bunch of data in a string and then dump all of it into a file. That data could be really long and then it might matter what methods I was calling. But actually there's some tricks I'll show you. Even today in our lecture, there are these ways of sort of incrementally building up a result as a string that don't involve expensive computation. So, I mean, uh, I, I'm not going to focus very much on performance implications, but I guess what I would say is that a lot of the implementations of these functions are what you might be able to guess. Like if you say, hey, I want to find this string, it has to like loop through the letters to find it. So if there's more letters, it will take longer. So like a lot of times your intuition about what might take more time or less time, like asking for the length of a string, it just stores that inside of it as an int. So that's very fast, even if you call it a lot of times. But we'll talk more about performance as we get further along. Yeah. Uh, there's no real distance. Oh, plus equals versus append. Well, I use the operators when I can. Append is like, you know, modify in place. And so you could use plus without wanting to do plus equals, if you know what I mean. So I like plus and plus equals because I learned Java before I learned C++. But I don't think one of them's right and the other one's wrong. You can use any of these you want on your homework and stuff. In fact. Uh, how is append handling memory? How does that? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> I haven't done much with memory yet, not going to get into it much, but basically all these methods do reasonable things. Like you're thinking about does it have enough memory to store those characters in the string? It'll figure that out. It'll, it'll take care of that. You don't need to worry about memory and stuff here yet. Okay, yep. So we, you use plus is equal to in the string in the previous slide, but plus is equal to doesn't work in character arrays, does it? Right, plus equal works with these string examples here, but there are other types that it doesn't work with, like you said, arrays of characters. Yeah, I'll talk about that in a second, but this works with strings concatenating other strings, and there's a lot of other things that it doesn't work with. Uh, so it's not as flexible in that regard as Java or Python or JavaScript would be. Um, the only one of these methods I want to highlight, most of these methods just do kind of sensible, simple things. The one thing I'll mention is find and rfind, which is like start from the back and find. Um, most methods that search for things, you know, they return you like an end of an index where it found the thing. So you might imagine if it isn't able to find that string, maybe it would return like a negative one, an invalid index. It doesn't actually return negative one. It returns a constant called string colon colon n pause. 
which means it was no position. <laughs> I don't know. So, like, that's the one thing when I go back to C++ and I start coding with strings, that's the one function I always forget. Oh, yeah, if you check if it not equals negative one, it actually never equals negative one. So that, that's the wrong test. So, oh, uh, yeah. Oh, this, uh, like string colon. Well, um, yeah, it looks like the namespace syntax, but I, I think you, you imported the namespace of uh, STD, but this is like the syntax for accessing a static member of a class. In Java, you say class name dot member. In C++, you say class name colon colon member. So I think even with the using and imports and stuff, you still need to say, you can't just write in pause. I think you have to write string in pause. Um, Okay, and there's a couple of additional methods that work on strings that are local to our Stanford projects that we give you. If you include our local library called string library strlib, you get some of these. Now, one thing about the syntax of these is that they aren't methods inside of a string like s dot method. Instead, it's a global function that you pass the string as a parameter to. The reason that these are different is because we at Stanford don't have the ability to modify the contents of the string in class. You know what I mean? We can't add methods to an existing class. We have to just write methods that take a string as a parameter. Most of these methods are designed to replicate Java features. <laughs> so, like, there's no ends with and starts with. You can call find and check if it's zero and see if it starts with something, but this is easier. Um, we also have conversion functions. These are helpful. You asked about, somebody asked about plussing on a C out statement. If you said plus integer to string, you could concatenate a string with an int that way. But of course, the, the waka waka is probably a little cleaner than that. But these are useful. Converting between types, you wouldn't believe it's kind of hard to do in C++. So having little functions to do that is nice, um, along with some other some other stuff. Yeah, question. So does C++ not have like, like, like default casting functions? Oh, you, well, there are ways of type casting, but you cannot cast an int into a string. Type casting doesn't, doesn't function properly in that way. Um, if you want an int to be a string, you really want to write out these characters that look like the digits of the int, and that's a little bit more complicated. And so, basically, it's a little bit annoying to do this without a helper. So we provide these these helpers. Yeah. So when you're using string to integer and you have a string composed of alphabets, then what does that return? Oh, if you if you try to call these with illegal, like you, you say string to integer and it, you pass quote one two three four, it'll return the int one two three four. But what if you pass like Marty Steph? It's not an int. These, I think they throw uh, an error exception kind of thing, crash your, your program, <laughs> pass it illegal data. There's other methods that I didn't list here, like there's one called string is integer, which is a Boolean, so you can say if the string is an integer, then convert the string to an integer. So there's other stuff in there in this library. I encourage you to look at the, the docs for that. Um, so let me mention a couple things. Uh, we've talked about C out and C in, reading uh, you know, input and output from the user. I taught you previously that uh, you probably don't want to use C in very much directly. You instead want to call these helper functions like get integer, get line, this kind of stuff. So if you try to read strings using C in, you could do that, but it reads one word, and so then the rest of your input, it would read the rest if you called it again, if you read from C in again. Sometimes you don't want a single word, you want a whole line. So the way to do that with our Stanford library is to call get line. And then whatever they type, the entire line of output will be, the input will be read. Um, there is a standard function that's not Stanford that's called getLine, but it takes two parameters. It takes where you want to read from and what string you want to store it in. Um, this getLine command, I'm not using any sort of return value, so how do you think I'm getting the answer back from the getLine function here? Any thoughts? Output in the orange, what did you say in the back there? Yeah, yeah go ahead. What were you going to say? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a reference parameter. It stores in this as an output parameter into it by reference. I know you can't see that on the slide. Sorry about that. But uh, anyway, mostly if I want to read lines from the user, I'll call this get line function with a capital L. Uh, there's an exercise here, but I'm behind, so I'm not going to do it. I'll tell you what, though. If you want to practice with strings, this is just a loopy thing that prints the little substrings of the word that you send it as a parameter. Um, I haven't mentioned yet, I have this tool that I think you might want to try. It's a practicing tool. It's called Code Step by Step. I put my name into the name of it. Um, shameless plugs. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's a website that just has a little uh, text box that you could type in code and run it and it'll test it for you. So like if you, if you go there, you can say I want to do this name diamond 
thing and you type your answer here and you submit it and it'll tell you if you've got the right answer and stuff. So, uh, you know, some of these slides have a little logo. That means that that exercise is available on that site. And then if you go to the class webpage, it has direct links to some of these problems that you can try out. So I, I'm a believer in practice, whether you use my dumb site or not. Like I think practicing is great and I think that's how students learn is just by going and trying stuff. Listening to me, you probably won't learn very much, but go try it and you'll get better at it. Um, so anyway, that's an exercise you can look at. Here's some code if you, if you want to peek at a solution of it. It's in the slides here. But um, I mentioned that there are two types of strings in C++. So now, now's where it all falls apart. So far it was okay, but now it gets bad. Um, C++ is built on another language called C. And they tried to make it be compatible with the language of C. And C had its own type of strings. And C++ added the thing that I just showed you, all the slides I showed you before, those are C++ strings. <coughs> those, are, those are the good kind of strings. We like those. They mostly behave in sensible ways. But the old language had its own kind of strings. And those are still there too. And they're both present in the language. And you have to, mostly you don't have to deal with C type of strings. But sometimes you do, and therefore I have to talk about them just a little bit. So if you write a string in quotation marks, technically that is a C string, the old kind. However, if you say string S equals something in quotation marks, it will convert that into a good C++ kind of string. So most of my code, that's what I will do. But C strings, none of the stuff I showed you in the past works. You can't call methods on them, like length or find or substring. None of those methods are there. C strings don't have any methods at all. You can't concatenate them with plus equals. That might have been your bug that you had. Um, all the stuff I showed you doesn't work with C strings. They, they basically don't do anything. <laughs> I guess the brackets for get, getting the characters, that works, but almost nothing else. Why doesn't it support anything? Because the C language is a very small language. It just doesn't provide a lot of stuff. C++ strings provide a lot more stuff. So, okay, if you want to not use these C strings, that's generally what I would say, is let's avoid these as much as we can. If you want to not use them, make sure to store your string in a string, C++ string variable. If you really need to convert a C++ string back into a C string, there is a function called cstr, but we won't use that very often. So, okay, look, let me try to show you where you might encounter a C string and how it might mess up your code. So if you say hi plus there, that looks pretty innocent. That would work fine in Java. But it technically doesn't work because that's a C string and that's a C string. And I'm trying to add them together. Now you might have said, wait, I thought, Marty, I thought you told me if I store it as a string like that, it will convert it. Well, but, but remember how code runs. It runs the right side first and then it stores the result on the left. So like, it doesn't do the conversion until it's done flossing the stuff. So this actually is bad. And in fact, <laughs> it. It's not only bad, but it doesn't even cause a compiler error. It lets you write that. <laughs> and then when it runs, it just does crazy stuff, and the program breaks and crashes and stuff. Now, what is it actually doing? Well, technically what it's doing has to do with a feature called pointers that I don't want to talk about really today. It's taking the memory address of this string and adding it to the memory address of that string, and whatever's at that memory address, it puts that into that <laughs> Which is probably some garbage or out of bounds or something, and the program will either crash or print garbage or something. It's just, this is silly, but it's part of the language. And that's a super common thing students do that just doesn't work in C++. Yeah? Uh, you said we weren't allowed to create strings unless we included the string library from C, but uh, just like in the starter code for the math, it's like I can type out like a string. <laughs> Well, you can write out strings like this without including the string library, because these are C strings. But if you want to declare a variable like this, you need to include that string header. Now, if you have a file where you didn't include the string header and you are able to declare these, that's probably because some other file in your project did include the string header. So if other files in your project include things, then often that will propagate to your file as well. But you, if somebody has to include that or else they won't work, yeah. So that doesn't work, that breaks. Um, that doesn't work, that's, that's similar. It's a string plus a care. That does similar kind of monkey business with memory addresses, so that also is bad. Um, a string plus an int does also the same kind of stuff with memory addresses. It goes to the memory address of the string high and it moves forward by 41 bytes. <laughs> oh, God. So actually what's really funny is like, if you have a really long string and then you say that really long string plus 10, it'll like give you the 10th letter of the <laughs> string, because you know, that's what's 10 bytes ahead. Of, anyway, whatever. So can't use plus, doesn't work with C strings. 
Um, it produces garbage. So here's another case. This one looks like it might be better. So I actually store it as a C++ stream, then I add 41. Like I wanted to say HI41, but instead it goes high parenthesis. What? Any guesses why? 41 happens to be the ASCII numerical value of the parenthesis character. So it thinks I'm adding a character, not an integer algae. So it doesn't do the right thing for that. Uh, yeah. And uh, you, somebody asked me about can you pass a string to an int? Uh, that's what I'm doing here. I have a string 42 and I passed it to an int. And I said a minute ago, no, you can't do that. Well, it's worse than that. You can do that, and it does a bunch of bullshit when you try to do that. So it takes this string, and whatever the memory address is that the string happens to be stored at, it converts that memory address into an int and stores that as the int end. So like, you think you're storing 4.2, 42, but instead it's like 8,276,000, whatever. It's just some memory address that happens to be stored in there. Like this, some, some hexadecimal memory location. Oh gosh. So the worst thing about these isn't that they're bugs. It's that the compiler won't tell you anything. It's happy to compile most of these examples. Depends which version of the compiler you have, but most of these compile just fine, and then when you run it, your program does crazy stuff. And super easy to accidentally do these things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This one works because here I convert this to a C++ string. But the TY is a C string. That's right. So this is still a C string, but C++ string plus C string, it does the right thing. <laughs> so as long as one of them or the other is, is you know, enhanced, then the whole thing is going to be OK. So yeah, it's very subtle. But like if you move this plus TY up here, it does the plusing before the conversion. But this forces the conversion to good string here, and then this will be saved by that. But yeah, isn't this crazy that you have to worry about this stuff? So un this is just unfortunate. It's just something we have to live with here. Um, so those are some bugs that you can run into. Uh, oh yeah, question, yeah. So before you were saying that controller H already uh, includes the string library, so then if you include it twice, is that, is that bad? If you include the same library twice, it's not bad. It won't break anything. No, they have guards to check for that oh. stuff. It'll be fine. So here's some ways to fix these bugs that were on the previous slide. So, oops, sorry. Um, if you explicitly write string parentheses high, that basically calls a string, C++ string constructor, and passes a C string parameter. So that one's converted now, plus there, that one works. Or the one that we went back to, which was high plus a C string, that works fine. Those are cool. Um, this one actually works. A string that's been converted plus a care, that works, because when you add something, it assumes it's a character. So that, that's OK. Um, and if you really want to convert the string 42 or whatever, you can use these convert functions like string to integer, integer to string. So there are solutions to all of these things, but you have to be aware of them. Okay? Yeah? Do functions that operate on arrays also operate in an identical manner on C strings? Um, the question is about arrays of characters versus C strings. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to sort of mostly punt on that question. I mean, in, in the old style of C strings, all they really are, literally, is an array storing care values. That's all a, a C string really is. It's a memory address of an array of characters. So C++ functions that ask for a string parameter, it is possible to pass them C strings or C++ strings or even arrays of characters, and it will handle all of them in a certain way. Um, but in general, I'm going to just really try to avoid using explicitly C strings. So I'm not going to encounter that in class, but, but there are some subtle issues of the syntax when you try to mix the two types of strings together. Yeah? Is this for example? So can you give out like, more strings like C strings? You just need one of them to be a C++ string. Yeah, what if it was high plus there plus Marty plus step? That would be OK if the first one only was converted, because like it does each plus sequentially. This plus that makes a C++ string storing high there. That plus Marty makes a C plus, it, it, it like consumes across, yeah, one of them, the first one being, yeah. But if you had high plus there plus string Marty, then the first ad would be both non C, yeah, so you can, there's so many different ways you can break this stuff, basically. Yeah. Um, would it work what you did in this example, high plus string there? High plus string there would also be fine. As long as you're doing a binary plus and one of them is good, then the all overall result will be good. Yeah. I would say I like four. I mean, I think some of these are things you can go try on your own, but like basically if, if you 
if you the first two are not either of them C++ strings, you're going to get in trouble. But as long as you're doing plus, 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 as long as one of the first two is a C++ string, you should be okay. I say, look, I have trouble remembering some of the subtleties. I try to avoid code that I think might run afoul of these things. So mostly just be careful, be aware. If you see weird stuff involving strings, you might be running into this kind of stuff. Just I want you to be aware of it. So okay, with that all said, I want to jump to another slide deck. I want to talk about streams and grids. And I, I probably have to accelerate a little bit to make sure I finish enough stuff today. So streams are for reading and writing files. And grids are a two-dimensional array-like data structure. We're going to use both of them along with all the other stuff we've been talking about on our first homework assignment. So let me try to launch into this here. If you want to read files, there's a library you can include called fstream, file stream. Uh, that's a system library from the brackets, you can tell. fstream is a library that includes classes called ifstream, input file stream, and ofstream, output file stream. These are things you can use to read input or write output to a file. The good news is that they behave almost exactly the same way that C out and C in behave. C out is an example of an object that's a lot like an OF stream, and C in is an object that's a lot like an IF stream. The reason they're so similar is because they use something called inheritance. They have common sh sharing of code and features with each other. So uh, that's cool because once we learn how to do C out, C in, you can actually write to files and read from files with a very similar syntax. So that's great. Um, I'm not going to teach you much about objects and inheritance today, but that's happening in the background of, a, of all this. Um, if you make a file object, an input file object, if stream, here are the different members that it has. You can open a file and pass it a certain file name, so now you're reading data from that file. You can um, get lines or words from the file using get line or this arrow operator. And then when you're done, you can close the file. That's the, I turned to blue the ones I think you actually need here. There's a bunch of other methods as well. But that's mostly it. I mean, if you had to read files or read data in your previous course with a buffered reader or a scanner or some kind of file object, this isn't that different from, from that. Yeah? Um, if the file name does not exist, then does opening return a negative value or an error or what? Yeah, um, if, you, if you try to open a file, I'm pretty sure that the, uh, the result of that is it, it puts the file into what's called a fail state. So you can say open and then check if the file has failed, basically. Um, okay, so here's a short example. If you want to open a file, read each line in a loop, do something with the lines, and then close the file. Here's how you do it. You declare a file stream, you open the file, and you write a loop that looks like this. You make a string called line, and while there's a next line that, that I can get, I will print the line, and then I will close the file. I think most of this is okay, but this middle part is a little weird looking, right? Like so I say string line, while get line. So what are some things like this while loop? I want to focus on that while line. Get line, input comma line. So what do I know about this parameter here? It's a reference. Get line looks here, reads from here, stores the result in here, and it goes out by reference, right? So that's a reference parameter. We learned about that last time. And then I'm saying while that. So how can I call a function in a while like that? What does that mean about that function? It returns a Boolean value. Yes, it returns true if it was able to read a line and false if it was not. So this looks weird, but like once you get used to it, that's kind of how you do it. While there's another line to read, do something with the line. Okay. Um, a couple things look different from something like Java. Like in Java, you would say like if stream input equals new if stream or something like that. That's Java syntax. That's not how C++ does it. <coughs> in C++, to make an object, you just write its type and its name, and that's equivalent to saying new whatever. You have created a new object now. And so open now initializes it to read data from somewhere. Yeah, in the back. Uh, if you put a, uh, an expression inside of a while uh, condition or a condition that uh, isn't novel, will it use trickiness to, to do it anyway? C++ does have some conversion between other types and Boolean. So if you have something that's an integer, you can use it in an if statement. And if the integer has a zero value, that's thought to be false. And any other value is thought to be true. So there are some conversions in C++ to Boolean. Not every type does that. Um, and the rules for that can be a little tricky. You can get some bugs from that. Like, like for example, some languages have strings where if the string is empty, that's false. And if it's non-empty, it's true. That's not quite how it works in C++. So, uh, I'll, I'll teach you some of those rules later. But yeah, there are, specifically for numeric and integer types, you can do things with the sort of Boolean conversion. Yeah? Um, you said if you do input dot, or if you, if you do like a, F, uh, a file dot open with a name that doesn't exist, it fails. Is there a function that lets you create a new <coughs> file from within your program? 
yeah, to make a new file, we'll use something called an OF stream, output file stream. So uh, I'll show you that in a minute, but but this slide doesn't doesn't cover that yet. Uh, yeah. So when you declare um, IS stream input, does it allocate memory for that? Um, yeah, I mean, you could think of this, if you're a Java person, think that I wrote equals new if stream. I went and created the new object, it's initialized, it is not null. If you have a notion of what null is, this thing is not null. This is a real object, it exists, it has been allocated in the memory, I can call methods on it. And that's just the difference of C++ to Java. If you create an object, it's there. Um, yes? Why is input also? Why is input? Oh, that's true. So actually, this get line, both of these parameters are passed by reference. I focused on the string being a reference, but it's also true that the input file stream is a reference. The reason that's true is because I don't want to copy the file or copy the reader of the file. I want to read from the object that you are using so that the reader will move ahead to the next line afterward. So I want to share that object in that function. So actually in this slide here, I, it's kind of hard to write these little errors out, but I wrote f ampersand, s ampersand, like a reference to a file, a reference to a string. That's what I uh, meant by that, yeah. So in this table it says that like, uh, in, uh, that, the, that the open method only accepts C style, C style strings and not C++. Plus. So this open, you're supposed to be able to pass a string here. This happens to be a C string, but usually you can pass a C++ string too. We used to find that on older Macs, they had this weird old compiler that you couldn't pass a C++ string, you had to pass a C string. So if you had a C++ string, you had to say dot C -ster on it. Ugh. But I'm pretty sure Apple has updated their compiler so that that doesn't need to be typed anymore. But I don't know, some of y'all are still running like Snow Leopard OS or something. Get a new OS for people. Um, yeah. So if the input isn't given as a reference, um, like if it wasn't, would it create a whole copy of input? How would that work? Yeah, if this were passed by value and not by reference, it would try to copy the object. And actually it would cause a compiler error because file stream objects don't have a copying uh, function provided. And so it wouldn't be able to know how to copy it, so it would error. So yeah, we'll teach more about that when we do classes. But um, yeah, one more, then I want to move on, yeah. Uh, is it possible to do like directly from an <coughs> input stream to an output stream like in one line? Oh, can you like pipe from an input file to an output file? Not, not in one line, but it's pretty easy to make an OF stream and then read from the if stream and write to the off stream. And yeah, we can do that. We'll definitely do stuff like that. Um, a common wrong way people do this, again, I'm sorry it's so low on the slide, is people say, well, while the input file hasn't failed, I'll read a line and then I'll print the line. That looks pretty similar to the code on my slide. Do you see, do you know maybe why um, the red one is not uh, as correct? Yeah. Because the, the first time it's going to fail, you're going to call get line, it's going to fail, but you're still going to run through processing of the line, even though it's not a real. Right, so if you call get line and there aren't any more lines, it will set the file to the failure mode, but then I'm still gonna print the thing, and then I wrap around and see that it's in the fail mode. So I'm gonna actually print one line too many, and actually what it'll do is it'll print the last line twice, basically. So that's, I see that a lot. A lot of students write that, and then they, the bug they post on a Piazza website says, why does it print the last line twice? You know, I should just point them to the, this thing. Yeah, yeah. Can you maybe use like a do while loop where it checks afterwards that works? You could use different loops. You could use a do while or a while with a break or something, but I just think this, this is so concise. I think this is what I would do. Okay, there's also a, a arrow operator, greater than, greater than. That reads a sort of token of input from a stream, like a word or a single number, something separated by spaces. So like if I have this file, Marty is 12 years old or whatever, if you make this string word and then you read like that, it'll read Marty is 12 years old. So it just looks for spaces or line breaks, just white space characters to divide with. Now it reads it as a string, but uh, you can read it as an int, like int age, and then input arrow age. That works because this arrow operator does understand how to convert types. It's kind of cool that way. Or you could read it into a string and then call string to integer. That works too. So this is cute. Um, a lot of times you want to do a mix of things, like read the lines and then look at the words on each line. I'll show you how to do that in a second, but this is kind of the, oh, the other thing is if you try to do this operator and there isn't any more data, then the overall result of the operator will turn into kind of a Boolean <coughs> false value that you can if else on or while loop on. So you could say while input arrow word print word and it would like print each word from the file or something. Okay, so that's reading lines, that's reading words, tokens, whatever. Um, if you want to mix where you read a line and then you want to slice apart just the letters or the words on that line, what you can do is you can make an object called an I string stream. And this is like another one of these stream readers with those same methods like open and close and arrow and all that stuff. But it reads from a string of data, not from a file. So like if this is my string, C++ or C string, 
then I can read tokens out of it, read me the first name, then the last name, read me the phone number, and it'll read these three things out. So that's kind of cool. You sometimes mix the if string with the i string stream to read a line from the if stream and then chop the words apart using the i string stream. Um, here's another example where I say to be or not to be, and then I do a while loop while I'm able to read words, print the words, so it prints to be or not to be. So between those examples on the last few slides, you should be able to sort of slice and dice most types of input that you're going to see. Yep. Can you use i string stream to take an input from a file? Well, right, can you mix these? Can you read it from a file using an iString stream? Well, not directly, but what you do is you make the if stream, you read the line, right. then you make an iString stream and you pass the line, right. and now you read the tokens on that line. So you mix the two together. You can't replace the if stream with this, but you can use them in concert, right? There's also an o string stream, which writes output into a string. And what I'll tell you about that is that it basically works the way that C out works. If you make an o string stream, you can less than less than to send information to it, and you're basically building a string. We talked about um, methods that were slow and stuff, and this would be a way of sort of accumulating, building up a string that would be efficient. And then when you're done, you say, okay, give me the string out. So it'll give me Zoidberg's age is 42 and his IQ is 95 or, or whatever, right? So why would you really want to do this? I mean, why not just print this to see out? Well, maybe I want to make this string up and then display it on a GUI on a button. Or maybe I want to make this string and then later I want to print it or something like that. You know, there might be some reason you want to build a string, but you don't directly want to send it to see out as you're, as you're building it. Yeah. So O string string is faster than appending to a string. Yeah, if you make a string object and then you loop and you do plus and plus and plus, what it has to do is kind of like adjust buffer sizes and copy things and stuff like that. And so this is kind of a more direct, I think a lot of languages have something like this, like Java has a thing called a string builder that lets you incrementally build up a string efficiently over time. And so actually on your homework one, one of the problems I want you to do is called Mad Libs. And so you, you read a file and it has little blanks in it, like a noun, an adjective, whatever. And then you look through the file and find all the blanks, and then you ask the user, tell me a noun, tell me an adjective, tell me a person's name. And then after you read all of those words, you dump out the story with the blanks filled in. So in order to do that, what you gotta do is read the file from if stream, and then build your filled in story as you're going along using an o string stream. And then finally, once you're totally done doing that, print it all to see out. But you don't wanna print it as you go, because with Mad Libs, if you've ever done that before, you don't say, well, give me a name, and they tell you a name, and then you tell them that line of the story. No, you wait till they tell you everything, <laughs> right? Because then it's funny, because all the words don't make any sense together. So you'll do this kind of stuff on your, uh, on your homework one. Yep. Can you go to the previous slide? Previous slide, there you go. Is that like the standard syntax for initializing a new, or constructing a new object? Yeah, so the syntax for constructing an object is you write the type, and then the name, and then a semicolon. But some objects basically take a parameter to their constructor. And so this is the syntax for passing a parameter to construction of an object. Between the name of the variable and the semicolon, I mean, basically, this is just like Java, except here you would say equals new the i stream stream. Like, that part is just absent, basically. Yeah. Um, just to clarify, the, the, the double arrows and the uh, get line functions, when there is no, uh, when they read, Yeah, when these arrows or get line fail, when there's nothing left to read, the result of the expression will be a false Boolean value or something that C++ will understand to be equivalent to a Boolean of false. So your code will know to stop the while loop or the if statement won't enter or whatever. Okay, so streams. Um, there are some Stanford methods for streams. If you include our file library, we just have some things like you can check if a file exists, you can, uh, you know, delete a file. These are all things you can do in regular C++, but it sort of differs whether you're on a Mac or Unix or Windows or some of that crap. And so we sort of try to take some of that out of the equation for you. We also have this method that reads an entire file. That's kind of cool. So you don't have to even do a loop. You can just read the whole file as a big string. Sometimes that's helpful. You don't need that for your homework, but sometimes that's a useful thing to do. Uh, renaming a file. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on this slide, but those can be useful uh, methods to use, functions to use. Um, okay, so I want to keep blazing ahead here because I just don't have that many minutes left. I'm going to talk to you about a collection called Grid. I don't need much time to talk about it because it's not too complicated, but you'll need it for your homework. So 
course, you always do the most important stuff in the last five minutes of class, right? Um, this comes from chapter five of the book. Next week, I'm going to talk a whole bunch about collections of data. That's the next big unit. Let's see, the next unit of material that we're going to cover. But this is kind of just going to get us started here. So I think you probably know what a collection is. It just it stores data inside of it, sometimes called a data structure. The pieces of data that you put in the collection, we call them elements. C++ comes with a lovely set of standard collections. It's called the STL, the Standard Template Library. Most C++ programmers learn all how to use the STL. That's what you do. The people who created the courses here at Stanford felt that these collections and the STL were hard to use and hard to learn for students. For example, if you go out of bounds with your index, it doesn't crash. It just goes to garbage memory and gives you garbage data. And that's frustrating for students who are trying to find their bugs, among many other weird glitches like that. These collections work really well if you know how to use them, but they're tough to learn. So we have written a set of collections of our own for here at Stanford. So <laughs> we called ours the Stanford Collection Library to make the names really confusingly similar. Jeez. Um, so we have our own collections. I'm going to teach you how to use our collections here in this course this quarter. Um, they're easier to learn. When I first got here and started teaching, I was like, oh, that's lame, man. We should do the real collections. Come on, especially 106x. We're all tough guys and gals in here, right? Um, but don't worry. Like, ours are actually really, really similar to the real ones, except that ours check for out of bounds and check for memory errors and stuff like that. And so once you've learned ours, it's super easy to switch to these, and you're fine. And at, before the class is over in December, I'll tell you enough that you could use these if you want. So don't worry that you're getting like a bunch of fake collections here. Like it's okay. Like give me a few months with these fakers, and we'll switch to the real stuff. Um, but anyway, just letting you know, uh, on your homework, if you really want to, you can use these. But I would suggest using these. It's simpler to debug. Um, so the first one of those collections I'm going to tell you about is a grid. It's a two-dimensional array type of a structure. You might say, well, why don't I just use a two-dimensional array then? C++ does have two-dimensional arrays, but arrays in C++ are kind of crappy. And if you go out of bounds, you get garbage data and stuff like that. So this thing is sort of an easier to learn with version of a 2D array. So you include grid.h. You make a grid. And when you create it, you tell me what dimensions, how many rows and how many columns. You also tell me what type of data you're going to store in each of the cells of the grid, the element type. These brackets you might have seen if you did Java or something. Java calls those generics. In C++, we call those type parameters or templates. So it's a grid that stores ints. You have to write the type here. If you don't, it doesn't compile. So that means three rows and four columns of ints. Uh, and now if you want to access the individual elements, you write the name of the grid followed by the row, followed by the column, and then you set a value to be stored there. There's also this shorter syntax where you use curly nested braces to tell it what the elements are and it'll initialize all of them. If you know what the elements are ahead of time, you can use that second sentence. Yeah. Um, are this grid initialized the values in the matrix, or is it just whatever was there? No one can tell you what the matrix is. <laughs> <laughs> you have to find out for yourself. Um, sorry, it does. <laughs> He would really clap if he had gone, whoa. <laughs> then it would have been great. Um, uh, no, but uh, it does, to answer your question, it does set all the values to zero, or some equivalent empty value. If it's a double, it's 0, 0.0. If it's Boolean, they're all false. Most language, most parts of C++ don't do that, but our collections do that to try to make it easier. Yeah. Do you have to specify what type of grid you're returning when you're returning a grid? When you return a grid, yeah, I'll show you parameters in return, I think, in a sec. But yeah, you, you always have to write these brackets of what the type is. Um, grid yeah. is a Stanford thing? This is a Stanford thing, yeah. University, yeah, the quotation marks, you can tell, right? It's ours. So yeah. Here are the member functions, the methods and stuff that you can call on a grid. You can access the elements. You can fill every element with the same value. You can ask whether a given index is in bounds or out of bounds, 0 to you know, whatever, minus 1. You can ask for the number of rows and columns. You can resize. You can you know, print the thing out to an output screen and see the data inside. So kind of standard stuff. Um, in general, like you guys might have learned something like array list or vector or something where you add and then it grows over time. This thing doesn't grow unless you tell it to grow. If you tell it, I want five rows and four columns, that's how big it is. And if you use those up, there's not going to add more for you unless you say, I want to resize to a new size. and it'll. We'll do that. You can, I think when you, if you want to go look at the documentation, you can, but 
there's some of these methods you can pass extra arguments like resize, do I want to keep the existing data or wipe it out? You can do all this kind of stuff. So most of it's pretty straightforward stuff, a two-dimensional array-like structure with those brackets to reach the elements inside. Yeah. What does it mean by OSTR? <laughs> oh yeah, what's OSTR? It means output stream. So like C out or a file or an O stream stream, all of those you can like write a grid out and it'll print it in a reasonable way. That's another thing about the built-in uh, STL collections. They don't have any printing functionality, so you can't like print them to see what's in them. Come on, guys. What are they thinking? Oh, well. <clears throat> so uh, I'm almost out of time, so let's see. What do I want to tell you? Mm. The one thing I want to say is when you pass a grid by parameter, as, as a parameter, you want to pass it by reference using an ampersand, because if you don't, it will make a total copy of the entire grid. And so a lot of times you're passing in the grid because you want to modify it or fill it in with data or something like that. So you pretty much always want to pass it by reference. If you know that your function isn't going to modify the grid, you can also write this word const at the front of it, which means constant. I'm not going to change the contents of the grid. Uh, I'm out of time, so I don't want to keep you over. I wish I had five more minutes, but I'll resume on Monday. But hey, if you want to get started early on homework one, it's up on the website. Go take a look, and at a minimum, get Cute Creator set up over the weekend, and we'll pick it up from here on Monday. Thanks a lot. I'll see you next time.